So uh, welcome once again. Uh, we, yeah, we've been here since uh, Tech Field Day 2. If you go back and look way back when, you'll see videos of me with hair <laughs> and, and stuff. Uh, <laughs> anyway, today we're here to talk about Network Services Orchestrator and automation in general. Um, so our panel here today, uh, Carl Marburg is going to be doing most of the presenting. He is our Senior Director for, pro for Product Management for uh, network orchestration as a whole. Our TMEs are doing the actual work, and I'm here as filler and to be a distraction in case something goes horribly wrong. So in terms of if we talk about NSO as a product, it's part of an acquisition we made about five years ago now called TLF. It's uh, from a long list of extremely successful exports from Sweden. In our case, uh, TLF is an orchestration product. It was um, heavily utilized <coughs> for uh, the acquisition that really drove Cisco's interest in the product. It is installed in a, uh, like <coughs> a large number of service providers. It's in all 10 uh, of the largest service providers in production. Uh, beyond that, we are getting a uh, growing following of enterprise accounts. Uh, a, good chunk of our, a good chunk of our business is um, we're accidentally successful in the enterprise. It's known for uh, a rich set of software interfaces, very programmer and developer friendly. It's known for its multi-vendor support and being built around a model-based architecture. So that's kind of a snapshot of the product. And with that, I will hand things over to Carl. Thank you, Omar. OK, so thanks for that introduction. So I'm Carl Moberg. Again, I lead the product management team around NSO and our general uh, automation orchestration. Uh, one of the products in the portfolio, obviously, is NSO. And I am delighted to talk to you about this today. One of the really cool things about having been part of NSO since its inception about eight years ago is that it's fundamentally a platform. And what that means is that we get to follow our customers, learn the ropes around how NSO works, and then go and attack <coughs> their own problems. Okay? So this is in contrast to these vertically integrated, you know, everything comes out of the box when you open it. This is truly a platform. So we've been able to follow, we have about 200 customers, about 150 of them are in production, follow them from their first steps, automating parts of their network, all the way to some of our customers having very sophisticated, pipeline-driven, uh, really software-centric development environment Excuse for automating their large-scale networks. We have 200 customers, 50 in production. 200 customers, about 150 in production, ah, okay. about 150. Yeah. What the other, 50, <clears throat> the other 50 are? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about it, because what happens here, and this is a great segue, so I'll, I'll probably cover it here. What happens is when you actually work in a platform fashion, the first thing that happens is, of course, we teach people how it works, kind of like a fishing rod. And then they go and fish in various fantastic lakes, and they pull up very ex exotic animals about with it, right? So it's, it's not something that we push to people uh, by proof point, but we teach them how it works, and they go and approach their own problems with it. Much more like a tool rather than a, than a finished, if you like, architecture. So what usually happens is that they start small, right? They start with very basic task automation, right? As they should. Most of them actually suffer greatly, uh, mostly from a data quality problem. They have configuration that is completely out of whack in their network. <coughs> configuration, that's the result of many years of manual interaction. So we've had customers that were very proud of their inventory systems were now 60% correct. So 60% of all configuration in the routers actually did something. And they were very proud. It took them months to get to 60%. Right? And that is actually when you open the lid, most large-scale networks have problems in that magnitude if they've been around for a couple of, of tech you know, uh, cycles. So they start with something easy like task automation, single box, simple task, mostly cleanups, just to regain control over the network that they've completely lost control over over the last couple of years. And then they move on to, through device automation, into <coughs> automating a complete domain. <coughs> and then they move on to cross-domain automation invariably. And at the end of this journey is actually attaching, if you like, the network to the business processes, thereby removing the final vestiges of, of having humans in the loop. But the time spent to actually get it into production can be months, right? Because you have to train your team, you have to get your infrastructure up, you have to get agreements around how to do these things. So therefore, after having acquired NSO, it usually takes a couple of months before they go and do their first task automation in live production networks. So there's always that drag, if you like. That makes sense? Totally. Very good. And what's been even more exciting is to start seeing the types of people, the, the job roles that 
uh, invariably form around platforms like NSO. And by doing that, we almost get a little bit of a, a magical insight on where network management in general and network automation maybe uh, predominantly is, is heading towards. And what we've done is we've actually structured our feature development and the way we present our things around these types of roles that we see. So I'll just briefly introduce you to them and we'll come back to them and we'll actually demo the uh, products around these roles. At the top is someone you all know and love and some of you have, have been and m might still be an, an, an actual network engineer, someone who works to keep the network up and running and humming and performing the tasks that someone wants it to do for them. If you're an SP in for operations, your subscribers are probably top of mind, your enterprises. If you're an enterprise uh, in for operations, it's probably your line of business applications and whatever is running on your network, that's the important part. So that's the network engineer that we know and love. When people take on something like an NSO, they really rapidly get to what we call the service automation person, someone who actually takes care of the automation systems themselves. This is probably where some of our service providers see their first resistance. They have to go hire for this, and suddenly they are trying to hire people that are, has a job role or profile that isn't very <coughs> common to them. But that person becomes very, very important very rapidly. And we really love this one. She's the service developer. What she does is she talks to the business owner, which normally <coughs> wants the network to do something for them. Again, as a service provider, you might want the network to do SD-WAN for you. As an enterprise, you might need service function chaining in front of Docker containers. So someone wants the network to do something. This service developer uses the tools that NSO provides to translate that into APIs and works with the infra operations to make sure that the decomposition step from the high level into the infra operations is correct. So it's a really important role that really bridges the business needs into the actual network itself. And we see that role as something that's taken off. And you see network engineers with a passion, you know, move from infra operations to service developer. And more importantly, and to me more excitingly, we see software people go straight to networking, right? Now that the barrier of entry is lower because you don't have to know as an MP anymore, um, you can actually go and contribute and do cool shit software in networking. So that's a, good, that's a good thing. That's the future of our business, guys. And what happens is that when you take this on, you fire up your team, um, you will re realize that there's a couple of axes that comes into play. I mentioned this kind of in the, in the slide before the last. More things, right? You start with something small. It's normally also a trust issue. We see that with every customer, and, and God bless them, right? Because they have tried and failed and got fired before uh, by applying something that, by approximation, kind of looks <coughs> like NSO, right? So it's all about building trust. And normally, they build trust by starting out in a, in a smaller piece of the network <coughs> and then growing the, the, uh, the application boundaries. Again. Hiring patterns, right? You start with your network engineers, eventually you will need an automation engineer, and eventually you need someone to talk to the business. And of course, uh, we all know and love all the parts of the network, so you usually start with single domain, you hit the other domains, and suddenly you have a multi-domain uh, thing that does a lot of things for you and satisfies all the organization. But again, customers start on the left and they go to the right, and it's a multi-year journey for everybody. And it's truly a team sport. And this also comes as news to many of our brethren in this industry. Um, for an NSO installation, we have somewhere between five to 10 other systems <coughs> that wants to either peek into it or tell it to do things, right? And we see such a fantastically interesting proliferation of the kinds of systems that we have around us. You probably recognize most of the logos here. Um, but we do see, for example, in enterprise, there's always some sort of overarching orchestration system. Uh, HashiCorp's Terraform is, seems to be doing really well here. Uh, most of our customers store, of course, their code in GitHub or GitLab, which is now part of uh, most network engineers' tool chain. We have partners in, in the sense of uh, companies' Itential and NetRounds for various things. We work with the Ansible crowd uh, to build Ansible modules. So it's, it's a fun time to be a product manager for a platform-like solution because we get to interact with so many different kinds of organizations and roles. Um, so you're working in parallel or as an extension? I mean, <clears throat> um, many, many sysadmin really love Ansible and other tools they like that. They love and, it. And they want to do everything, even if they That's have to do it once. Right. So they spend 
few days to write the stuff, yes. but to run one. And I saw this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so are you working as, you know, something that, you know, is part of another, another silo, maybe there is some communication in between or behind or, you know, on top of it? I'll go out on a limb because you guys are, are friendly, I, I hear. Both Ansible and Terraform are really good application lifecycle managers. They're not very good with networking. Now, we provide a set of abstractions for both Ansible and Terraform that makes the network look like a database. So you can literally have a REST, you know, create, read, update, delete to all the configuration and all the services in your network. Suddenly you hear that clicking sound where both Ansible and Terraform can now, without exploding in complexity and module proliferation, actually address the network as a whole through a singular API. So that's the most common pattern. The application operations team has Terraform or Ansible, and instead of sending faxes to Ariel, to our networking person, they can now actually express what they need from the network in their local tooling and talk through NSO into the network. Okay. That's, that's the most common pattern. All righty. So here's it, here it is. Yes, it's a campy riff on this company's payoff right now, but it's also true. We want to be a great bridge between the networking side and everything else. We want people on the top of this slide to think that talking to the network through anything but NSO is a waste of time and makes my life miserable. It's so good that I will not talk to a network without having NSO between it. <coughs> and we have a whole variety, right? Again, you have from our SP friends, there's a lot of OSS and BSS systems that are usually horribly complicated, horribly expensive. And many of our customers have overspent on trying to adapt them to talk to the native interfaces of the devices. Now we provide them with a single REST interface, so they need one uh, adapter, if you like, and they can reach the whole network. All of our customers, when we arrive with them, have already have scripts and applications. They have Ansible, they have Bash scripts, they have Perl, tick, Tickle TK, right? And what we're doing is we're saying, instead of talking directly to the discrete boxes, talk to the API. You will have the same visibility, so you don't have to throw things away. You don't have to actually burn things down. All you do is you schmooze your way up on top of NSO. So a whole wide variety of a combination of, of course, humans and software uh, that once again wants the network to do something for them, either for operational reasons to keep the network humming, or for what could be called services or application reasons, meaning there's a subscriber that wants the network to do something, or an application that wants the network to do something. And of course, it spans physical and virtual infrastructure. And yes, we will get into the technical details. So this is setting the stage more than anything else. So you're aiming to do everything via NSO. Uh, what's the smallest customer that you target? Ah, the smallest customer is, here, here's how we usually measure it. How big is the networking team? See what I mean? Okay. Yeah. So if it's a team smaller than, let's say, two, three people, NSO is probably a little bit of an overkill. Yeah. But we have customers that are down to a really small footprint in, ter in terms of devices. Another angle here is how frequent are your changes and how expensive is it to fail? Mm -hmm. If you have frequent changes that are horribly expensive to fail, you probably want the robots to do it for yeah. you. Okay. So those are kind of two dimensions that we usually look at. Here is what it is. It's a piece of software. People install it on their favorite Linux, either on bare metal, surprising amount of people still do it on bare metal just to get the last percentage of punch out of the hardware. Um, people are, are trying to get their arms around VM-based provisioning of these types of applications, and some of the forerunners are now deploying this with uh, Docker. Right? So we don't really care. The manifestation in the runtime is a single Unix user land daemon that is the actual product. Um, it talks to the network through two means. It talks through what we're probably mostly known for, the, what's called the network element driver or NEDS, to actually talk to the control uh, point, to, to the configuration <laughs> protocols. And for VNF, for, for VM and, and, and <coughs> eventually container-based networking, we also have something called ESC, which is an integral part of our offering that allows for life cycling the VM or container-based um, uh, networking functions. Um, we have, broadly speaking, three types of users on top of this. Network engineers, as I mentioned, ops and provisioning, and the service developers. They either talk to the network through what we call the device manager layer. And what the device manager layer is, is that it's actually an exposure of the data structures available through the native interfaces in the devices. So if you look through the device manager onto a, an iOS XR box, you will see the data structures that correspond to the XR CLI. If you look at an F5 
REST interface, you will see the object structure that's evident through their REST interface. <laughs> kind of a, a, a bare exposure of the data structures that constitutes the configuration operation okay. of the devices. Sure. So the network element driver yes. is the component that really interfaces with your infrastructure. Yes. You support, I'm sure that you support, I'm not a networking guy, but, <laughs> and I'm sure you support almost everything, but what happens if I have something that you don't directly support? Do I have the ability to write something that uh, resembles a network element driver, you know? So we, right now we have almost 200 uh, different element drivers. So unless you have a very exotic network, we probably already have one. But let's say you have one, then there's two extremes. If it's a well-behaved, somewhat standards-based, let's say netconf or restconf, we can actually generate the net. So we actually build it based off of the Yang modules. So that's the good side. Very few are here. A very small part of the industry is here. It's more likely to be something exotic and has a, a Cisco CLI-like CLI thing, because that's what they built in the 90s. Um, we have the framework, and we have, of course, a whole set of an engineering team that does nothing but manage these nets. So normally, in customer engagements, we give ourselves about two weeks to build new NEDs, um, and then we support them going forward. Right? Okay. So we, we try to be, and you, as you can imagine, that's one of our competitive advantages, to be very snappy uh, in the response time and build that library based on, on customer needs. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> and on top of the device manager, we have something called service manager. We will touch on this a couple of times. That the easiest way to describe this is that the service manager allows the service developer to abstract away the details of networking. So they can express what a service looks like, depending on who's going to actually consume it, and then use the package manager to load that in, and you can start ordering things through the northbound interfaces. You stand it up roughly where you have your SNMP uh, stuff and obviously needs to talk to the network. Uh, we'll talk about scaling properties, but it's a very basic and pared down piece of software. We love to scale down as much as we scale up, and it's something that we build for Linux and actually for Darwin. Many of our customers uh, run, uh, for their development and testing environments, they run uh, uh, NSO on their the Darwin based for their, their Apple laptops, basically. All righty, here's our first Again, here's our first user then. So Ariel, you know her really well. Um, pressure on her is to do more with the same or do more with slightly less over time, relatively more. That's what she needs to do. She has a lot of technologies, a lot of vendors, and a big thing for her is that he has, she has a lot of generations. She should, you know, rarely do you meet someone who has a greenfield network. Rather, is it three or five generations of Cruft in your network? Stuff that she likes here, uh, we'll, we'll cut to that, is first of all, the, again, what we're probably most known for is the network element drivers. This is a, a, a piece of magic, actually. Um, <coughs> it is something you load into the system, and it's specific to operating system platforms, right? So we have one for XR, one for NXOS, one for Junos, and so forth. And what it does is that it abstracts the underlying protocol. So Ariel doesn't have to understand whether this box talks CLI or TL1 or CORBA or REST or GNMI or whatever it is, right? The NEDs, the NED code will take care of the marshalling and unmarshalling and creation of uh, operations or commands and sending that to the device. And here's what's cool. When you stand up NSO for the first time, of course, you have to tell it. Where are my devices? What kind of devices are they? And how do I authenticate? Right? So that's the first thing you do. So you, t you, you teach NSO how to do that, and we'll show that in the demo. And then you do something called a sync from. So you ask NSO to sync from the devices. And it will use, of course, the native protocol to fetch the running configuration. And here's where, where we differ from others. When that running configuration comes at you, uh, be that in line-by-line -line CLI commands or XML or JSON or whatever it is, we parse, tokenize, parse, and pick apart that data and we put it into our database, which I will touch about, touch on a little later. Um, and then we throw away the textual representation. Okay, so it's not a system like others where we store .txt files or XML files or JSON files. So that's being put into the data store. And then NSO also knows how to do the other way around. So you take data out of that uh, data store, and the NEDs know how to produce the ordered set of operations or commands that make sense to the device. So that's kind of the basic abstraction that's really important here which again makes the network look like a database. You don't have to care about ordering. You don't have to care about understanding CLI errors. 
And we've actually also added um, transactions to this. We'll talk about that later. But this means that you can actually think of the network as one big, if you like, box uh, that you interact with through a single interface. So Carl, even if I've got a switch that doesn't have an API, you'll go in with the command line, pull the data out, and then and then structure it for me. That was the first thing we got out, got after. Right? We we understood nine years ago that we need Juniper and we need Cisco. So we we said, well, Juniper is they have NetConf, right? So that that's fine. We have all the all the functions needed for that. Now, here's what we need, needed to solve. We needed to, fundamentally, we needed to be able to say, here is a configuration for a Cisco particular version of a platform. Here is any other. Now we need to be able to create the diff, the delta. What are the ordered sequence of commands to go from any to any? And that's what the NEDs do. They can always generate that ordered set of commands. And that can be horribly complicated. For example, if you change anything inside of a BGP stanza, or for that matter, a BGP AS, you actually have to regenerate whole parts of the configuration because the data you changed was a key. Yeah. Cool. Again, we're, this is probably what we're mostly known for. Our customers started out with the usual suspects, the layer two, layer three players. As they grew their footprint among these axes that I talked about before, we started seeing interest both kind of down the stack, so we have a good and comprehensive support for your favorite optical vendor. Uh, but also up the stacks, you will also see um, like um, uh, industry-specific solutions for mo mobile networks. You have security appliances. Um, many of our customers obviously are hybrid cloud, so there are NEDs for AWS and VMware and, and a whole slew of others. We're trying to really stick to networking. So before someone asks, no, it's not very appropriate for general management of applications. We're not trying to replace uh, Ansible for bringing up your web server. You will find that the pattern here is that it's either networking gear or gear that's around to support networking. That's important. You mentioned custom net, custom NEDs. What is like the barrier to creating a new NED? If you know, like, yeah, someone comes to you. What does that look like? What's the time frame? What's sure, the sure. So the first thing we do is we look at the actual protocol, and if it's a known protocol, like it's HTTP with JSON payloads, i.e., REST, we, that code we have, <laughs> and the NEDs are actually in two pieces. The one is the scaffolding, the protocol part. The other one is actually using Yang to describe the data structure of the box that you're managing. So it is all about making sure that the protocol scaffolding actually works, so it doesn't have weird accept headers and stuff like that so that we don't support. And then you start actually developing a Yang module that corresponds to the data structures in the device. If the protocol exists, you know, we have people that are really fast. I mean, in a couple of days, normally, because they have to leave through usually configuration, uh, you know, manuals or look at Swagger and what have you, we will have something for a subset of that configuration. So you, that usually is part of the, uh, a POC or something that we can do for just in a, in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And there are two, we, we try to keep the NEDs in two types, right? So we have the POC NEDs, and there's a whole slew of those, and we have production NEDs. Production NEDs, if, you, if we were to walk over to Building 16, you will see that we have, for this product, an insane amount of hardware. Because we have a continuous build system that covers most of these vendors with actual gear running in a Cisco building. Um, so we only go to production if we believe that this customer and a couple of other customers will actually want this, so we actually uh, invest in the hardware or <coughs> software version of what we're managing. So if you had something unique, you would help facilitate that for a specific customer. Absolutely. And then if there's a, a broader subset of customers that you believe will need that, you'll move that to the main production part yes. of that. Okay. Yes, exactly right. And, and it, can, it can be very unique. There's a, there are Japanese switch vendors that I had no idea existed. <laughs> 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 I had no idea that they existed. And a customer big enough for you to care about. Yep. Big, yep, combination of those. Yep. Combination of those. I mean, it, it's a it's a pretty cheap thing for us, and we'd rather spend on increasing the count of NEDs than be harsh about it. So, let me understand a little bit better. I mean, yeah. the, these two is automation tools, so uh, and abstraction tools somehow of yes. the network that you have yep. underneath. But you have a complex network made of different type of switches, and yes. one of them is different from the others. Yes. No, it doesn't have the same functionalities. Right. So when you propagate and you want to reach, you know, the level of configuration, yeah. you know, you encounter some limitations of the switch. And how do you react to that? Yeah. I mean, yep. uh, th that can create a, yeah. uh, you know, 
boatload of issues yes, everywhere. Yes, it, it, it not only can, it kind of does. You have to remember that NSO doesn't know anything about networking. See what I mean? It is literally almost like a protocol translator. Yeah, it's so, like me. I don't know. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you're just a you, you're, you're mere conduit, right? That's, that's, you're just a carrier of, of meaning. So, I mean, you can, you can go wrong in so many ways, right? But it, it will give you a very structured way of interacting with that device. And there are a number of dimensions here that we had to do a little trickery to get around. So, for example, if you have a cage-based device, it depends on which line cards are slotted in. The CLI may actually look different from, you know, the second before you slotted in the card and the second after the CLI changed. Let's just say that CLIs were never built for machines. So they do all these trickery and, mm -hmm. and plant mines all over the place. And we have ways, as long as we can figure out, as long as there's a, 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 a way of actually asking for what is the hardware configuration right now so we can map to that, we try to do that. But in many ways you can't. And then we try to be more lax. So we will allow people to shoot themselves in, in all three feet um, rather than try to, try to um, constrain the system. But it, it's a big, interesting field, and there's also, there's a, there are many war stories. I mean, there's also configuration where you configure something over here, and it dynamically changes the configuration over here, which is also horrible for, for machines, right? Okay for humans, but not good for machines. So there's a whole lot of scaffolding around these warts and outliers, in, in, typically in CLIs, that we cover in the NEDs themselves. <coughs> That's a lot of words to give you a brief answer. Okay. <coughs> What's so cool about this is that when Ariel trusts the system, which is always the first thing, because she literally doesn't, but when she does, she starts thinking. And normally, we didn't see this coming, but normally um, most of our customers gravitate towards our command line interface on the northbound side. So NSO actually has two types of CLIs. It has a Cisco style CLI and let's just say a J style. CLI, so most network engineers start with that because, of course, they have the control commands in their, in their DNA already, so it, it's a very easy and, and, and friction-free way of starting. They ev eventually understand the irony of being on a CLI on an orchestrator, and they start asking for, you know, can, can I maybe do this with a REST interface, so they start whipping out maybe Python with a request library. Um, Eventually, they're, they're going to ask for Python bindings. We have that as well. Um, and if they're really serious about it, uh, some, some of our uh, customers go to Java because they need things like unit tests. The point being is that it's a very s somewhat seamless transition. You start with a CLI, and at your own pace, you move towards other ways of interacting with the network. And at the core of this is this, these are just means of getting to the data in NSO, change it to your heart's content, and then have NSO change your network according to what you just did to the data. And this is always interesting to see when the first Python book turns up on the desk of these network engineers, right? And when, when does the first question about the Python library come in from a customer? We can almost set our watches to that. At the heart of this system is a database. So it's literally a database with some decoration around it. It is a database that we realized early on would have to be pretty specific to the domain. We have customers <coughs> are, that are doing on the order of 15 to 20,000 transactions per 24 hour cycle. So one of the things we realized early is that there's no way we can touch disk. It needs to be in memory. We wanted it to use Yang natively, right? No translation, no ORM or anything like that because Yang in, in and of itself has a lot of really cool features that we can use. Um, so it's an in-memory database with a journal backend. Uh, so it actually runs in memory, so it's a very uh, nicely tuned. We have customers that have on the order of uh, about 110,000 devices under management uh, for NSO. Um, so we really like the scaling properties of it. Um, and again, that's at the core of this whole idea of looking at your configuration operational state as a database rather than a set of discrete um, configuration protocol endpoints here. And there's a hidden understanding here is that NSO and solutions like NSO works best when you allow it to be the source of truth, right? None of our customers can do that to 100%. But they are trying to go in that direction, right? To have one single source of truth and have that to be system level software. And of course, there's always, always people doing things out of, out of band, right? So they go straight to the device even though they maybe shouldn't. Um, and CDB or NSO as a whole has means of both doing what we call sync from and sync to. 
So some customers feel like whatever the network engineers do must be right. So we can always sync from the network uh, and, and make sure that the database locally in NSO is aligned or uh, kind of count on uh, network engineers always doing the wrong thing and write over. So there's, a, there's two worldviews to that and we try to cater to, uh, to both here. Um, when people start building services, they realize that as opposed to workflows, um, they want a declarative and cheap way of going from one configuration, if you like, or one state uh, to the other. So the name of our internal APIs, which is part of the magic sauce here, and we'll see some parts of it in the demo, is something called FastMap. However, we have found limitations with that kind of declarative role. The first thing we found was, for example, in, in virtualized networking, um, there's this step where you have, have to ask OpenStack or something similar to bring up a VM, a VM-based router or switch or security appliance, and wait for it to come up before you can actually tell it to do things, right? So you actually have to do a, a couple of asynchronous back and forths with the infrastructure. So we use something called Reactive Fast Map, which is a very, very cool uh, set or type of programming um, where you can express a stepped process from nothing to, for example, boot up a VM. When it comes back up because OpenStack, or when it comes up because OpenStack tells you so, you can then go ahead and reach out, authenticate yourself, fetch the SSH keys, and send the configuration commands, right? And as a developer, all you have to do is describe start and end. And we will actually use what's called reactive fast map, which is, let's call it a reversible uh, workflow to go from A to B by consistently applying ourselves towards that, uh, that goal. And in my mind, if there's anything in this industry that's actually intent-based, it's reactive fast map. That gets very close to the academic definition of intent-based interactions. It's a really, really cool thing. Faster, simpler compliance. Again, what we do in this first phase is just bring things up, get used to NSO, start cleaning up your network. So this, this slide kind of almost covers the entirety of that first phase with the network engineering team. So what they do is they do that sync from, they pick a router or a switch that they feel is correctly configured, right? This looks right. They save the configuration as a template, and they start applying that to all the other devices that are of the same type. They marvel at the amount of stuff they have in their configuration that shouldn't be there, and they start working to minimize that list. When they go down to something acceptable, they hook it into usually uh, a 24-hour cycle, so they run it every 24 hours to make sure that they catch people that are deviating. Uh, from so these templates can be applied to Linux instances or containers? Of course. Because that's where we run networking devices as much as it does to an iOS Absolutely. device from 15 years ago. Yes. Right. For sure. So the templates are varied and diverse, which makes it gets a little wafty here. So it's sort of, I just want just want to clarify. I that think, are, are we showing we're showing templates? Good. Yeah. We'll we'll get less okay. wafty. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So, but this is the entirety of it. When what when this is successful, Ariel comes out trusting the system, hopefully even liking the system, and now she has a network that is reasonably in shape to the extent that we can actually start automating on top of it. Time for the first demo switch. Oh. Um, uh, can I ask can you? I, uh, our that would be a nice segue. You do that while they're setting up. <laughs> <laughs> so the, how the product is licensed. Yep. So one of the biggest challenges, truly, as a, as a product manager for NSO, is to figure out how my customer wants to pay. For they, the want, they don't want to pay. Well, first of all, they don't want to pay. But when we're beyond that, right, <laughs> it is interesting to see how varied the opinions are across our customer base, enterprise and service provider, about how to pay for that. Most of the templates they have, I'm being mean now, doesn't actually work. So we get into a position where we actually have to make up a, a way of charging for it, because of course, you know, as, as big as we may think Cisco is, we have some pretty large customers too that want to describe how to pay for it. But it defaults back in most cases to right to manage, so a one-off. Well, first of all, most customers today don't want perpetual licenses. They want ter what's called term-based licenses. Right to manage. Subscription. Subscription. Type of devices or, or number of different NEDs, if you like, and then usually size of the footprint. And in, and in some way, multiplying those three and end up with a nice 
number that we can then argue over if it's the right one. Okay. That is that is. Yeah, so it's an opinion, but actually it's the the sum of now type you know, number of brands. Let's yes, say number of platforms. Number of yeah. platforms yeah. plus number of devices. Yeah. Size of the footprint. Yes, that's okay. fair. That is fair. That's about where it comes down to in most cases. We have customers that want to pay per transaction. That's that's fine. You know, it, it does guide their behavior. So they do less transactions, which is probably not what they want. So we have had a variety of opinions, but that seems to be the at the core of this. Okay. All right, Dimitris. Okay. Uh, so I'm Dimitris. I'm going to be showing you the network services orchestrator, hands on. Um, as Carl mentioned, it is a platform, and it allows you to interface with it, to interact with it in many different ways. One of them is CLI, pretty boring. We're going to be using the web UI, the web interface of NSO, to look at a demo. And at some point later on, we'll be looking at the programmatic interfaces that NSO allows you to interface with it, interact with it as well. So let me just quickly log on to the system. We, the landing page of NSO is a set of tabs, a set of panels and it's the control center of the system. You can do various things. I won't dive into each and every one of these. Um, I'll just touch briefly on the dashboard that gives you a high level overview of what's the health of my systems, what, how many devices am I supporting, how many services are running, and what their health state is at this point of time. Move quickly back, because the important thing here is, sorry, the device manager. The device manager is the control point to your infrastructure. You register your devices in the infrastructure through NSO. Uh, if you look at the tabs carefully, there's a name, there's an IP address, there's a port. These are simulated for the purpose of this demo, but they could be real devices. The important column here is the type, and the type is actually the NED. It's the platform, it's the operating system that's running on the device. And there are quite a few here. Not only Cisco, we have other vendors included in the demo as well. From this point, I can ping a device, I can connect to it, but most importantly, I can perform actions like check sync, sync from, sync to, and compare configuration. This gives me a view in my infrastructure if it's exactly as I intend it to be. So NSO, when you install it and you control the devices, you sync the configuration from them. It stores that configuration in the database, and at any point in time, you can check your network that it's still in uh, consistency. There, um, as I mentioned, there are other tabs here. The one that I'll pay, I'll focus on now is this TME demo. Now, what we're looking at is the standard product, but what also NSO allows you to do is to render web user interfaces that are very specific to your applications, to what you try to do with the network. So us in technical marketing, have come up with an interface that is rendered automatically within NSO and depicts our infrastructure. The infrastructure is larger than this, but I'm focusing only a portion of it that I want to demonstrate today. So we'll be looking at a use case around a data center. We have two data centers here, number one and number two. We have a set of spine and leaf switches, and we have also a set of routers that are there to ensure that we have connectivity between those two data centers. The use case that I'll be going through is that we want to connect compute hosts that are not depicted here, or VMs that are there to support a specific application. So we want to bring up an application on one side of the data center, on DC1, and then we need to bring up another system on the other data center and somehow interconnect them. I have a customer here called Acme. I'm going to drag one of the switches onto that customer, and now it brings me inside NSO's actual interface, where I can select an interface for that particular switch. So what I'm assuming here is that I want to connect a system on this switch on this interface. This is all the input that NSO has asked me to provide. And this is based on the model that I have created for this particular type of service. Which switch do you want to connect? Which interface from which switch? Very simple from my perspective, the input that's requested. But if I look at the actual configuration, what NSO is doing behind the scenes with this input, it's determining that switch is connected to which spine. 
and from that which configurations I need to push to the spine switches as well in order to satisfy the requirement of this particular service. So on the left hand side you're looking at what's existing on the device today at this point of time. On the right hand side you're looking at the configuration that I want to push to the device to satisfy my service, to satisfy my intent. And as you can imagine, this is the kind of view that the network engineer stares at for the first 500 times before they start maybe trusting NSO, right? They will be staring at this before they shoot it off into their network. So this type of transparency we've also found to be extremely important, right? Because again, as soon as something's hidden or you get a more of an opaque feeling, people get the chills and don't want to don't touch it. Okay. And again, this is in a curly notation resembling it is based on the Yang models. You can also have a view at the native configuration. NSO understands which devices it's talking to, what is the native language, and it will present to you the native language of that particular device. So this is where the engineers perform their validation. Is this what I want to send to the device? I know Cisco CLI, I'm looking at it in front of me, does this you know, make sense to me or not? And if you scroll down, you'll see the rest of the devices in a similar fashion. I'm just going to push commit, so I'll push this down to the devices themselves, and this will perform the magic through the nets and I push the configuration to the elements. Now at this point of time, you notice that there's three devices highlighted in the UI, and those are the ones that were affected by my actions. One switch, one interface, three devices configured. Now, if I drag another switch across, because I want to connect two applications, two systems. Again, in a similar fashion, I will select an interface at random and I will push the configuration. I will go to Configuration Manager. That is another control point, one of the tabs that we saw earlier, and we'll see something similar. This is a device of a different operating system. You'll notice, though, that there's no configuration for the spine switches, because that's already been performed. And this is where FastMap comes into play. It knows what it has pushed into the network and it doesn't need to repeat itself. So similarly, I'll push the commit button and these configurations get affected into the network. I'll go back to my UI and now we have four devices highlighted. I'm going to drag now a switch from the other data center. <clears throat> Again, in a similar fashion, select an interface and I will go to my commit manager. Similar input, but if I look at the config now, it's going to be drastically longer. Not only am I configuring on the other side of the data center, let me just switch, am I configuring the switch itself, number five. I'm also configuring the spine switches, but I also now need to reach out to the DCIs, to the data center interconnects on both data centers to make that bridge. NSO is computing all that for me. It shows it to me in curly native um, format. I can see the native configuration like I did earlier. And if I feel confident with what I'm pushing into the network, I will perform the commit. Can I ask you? Yes. So you are applying all this configurations in a very clever way. But how do you check if the state of the network remains the same? I mean, do you have any feedback at a certain point? I mean, I am crazy again. I am going into my data center. I'm not a networking guy. I make a mistake in a configuration of DCI3 just because I'm because crazy that's who there. Yeah. So how can I check that, right. you know, is there any mechanism to recheck everything or here comes the platform nature of the solution. Um, what we're doing now is poking around in configuration. So you, you, you saw the tree shape. I mean, there's actually a device tree. That's where all the configuration for all the devices hang. And you have a services tree. Under the device tree, there's also what's called a live exec or a live branch. So you can always query the device for a variety of, of, of running data. So the way customers do this, again, back to the platform thing, is that they decide how do I check this. I mean, if, is BGP up and do I have the same amount of prefixes? You know, how, how, what is a good way of checking this? And NSO provides a view into that. So you can do pre and post checks, typically, right? So you, you look for something before, you do the thing, and if the post checks fail, we can actually automatically roll back. 
Now, this is a slippery slope because what customers eventually realize is that configuration and live state in the devices themselves aren't enough. You actually have to go and check how the network performs by normally tapping into the, the stream of packets or tapping into the service layer itself. So many of our customers have what we call um, um, or orchestrated assurance. So as we stand up something like an L3 VPN or a service function chain, we also spin up test boxes at the edges and they do their thing across the actual data path as part of the provisioning here. So it depends on what you need all the way from really basic stuff like did the interface come up, <laughs> then we're happy to, is the frame delay you know, in this <laughs> layer three service inside of the SLA? And the system kind of looks a little different depending on, on, on how. So NSO provides a certain set of means for it, <coughs> uh, but it's normally in combination with external systems. Okay. So uh, just to wrap this up, the last thing that I want to do is that, again, regardless of what my infrastructure looks like, the service has abstracted all that complexity away. I don't care if this particular switch belongs to one vendor, the other switch belongs to a different vendor whatsoever. To me, they look all the same. What I want is I want to configure a connection to a switch so I can hook up a device, whether it's physical or virtual, and make sure that it will communicate with a device that's on the other side of the data center or other side of the world. Um, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to remove switch number one the switch zero, which was the first one that I configured. And if you recall, when I deployed this, it configured spine zero and spine one. So I'm gonna remove it. Now, if I apply that configuration, logically, it should undo the spines as well. But NSO is clever enough to figure out that, you know what, there are other elements in the environment right now as part of my service that still depend on the configuration that are on those two switches. So switch number two still needs to talk to switch number five. So NSO is going to regenerate the code now based on the logic of the service on the model, and it's not going to touch anything else apart from switch number zero. And it does this all automatically for me. I don't have to program NSO to do this for me. It's part of the secret source within NSO. It determines that there's parts of the configuration that are used for other purposes. So I'll just push this into the environment as well. Now, there's all sorts of information within NSO. We've just built this UI to make it easier to demonstrate it to you. I'll just highlight now uh, the device configurations. If I select a device here, I'm just going to bring up a window that shows me the actual you know, configuration that's on the device at this point of time. If I scroll down, because I've selected a particular tenant in this case, it will highlight even the part of the code that belongs to that service for that particular tenant. I can see this uh, view in various formats. That is what's stored in the configuration database. That is the native, as I mentioned, uh, language of the device. I can translate it to JSON. I can translate it to XML. I can translate it to YAML. Everything within an SO is built so you can interact with it <coughs> and programmably interface with your infrastructure. And let me plant to you a seed then, where I'll tell you that this YAML is what you paste into your Ansible modules. So you literally actually generate the config encoding out of the boxes themselves, and you use that in your Ansible modules. For those of you who actually, uh, well, care for, care for um, YAML in Ansible. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves it's YAML. Like <laughs> How can you not love YAML? Don't be mean to YAML. Huh. YAML is only good in sense that it's not XML. <laughs> <laughs> is this an Number HTML5 interface. interface? Sorry? Is this an HTML5 interface or is it Flash or Java? No, it is HTML5. This is a very, very, it's actually framework-less. So it's, it's, it's yeah. yeah. 